bring you some of the world's best story. Welcome to the Resiliency Project. Here we bring you some of the world's best stories about resilience and reinvention. Um, we, uh, I'm so happy to be joined by my partner in crime, PJ Kwong. PJ, welcome to the Resiliency Project and thanks for helping us do this. Uh, this has been an incredibly difficult week for all of us. Yeah. Um, just watching some of the terrible events that we've seen in, in the United States and and the lack of action that we've seen for years, I think it's time that we really, really see some some changes in our society. How how has this left you feeling? Well, I, I'm somebody who's sort of uh, kind of for all of my wackiness, I'm actually quite a sensitive person, and so a lot of this has left me feeling heartbroken that that it's come to this. Now that said, I'm also feeling quite hopeful because I really believe that change can only come through chaos. So, um, and as a mother, kind of uh, not as the mother of biracial children. Um, the idea of racism and stopping racism in its tracks is something that's near and dear to my heart. It is 2020 after all, people. Come on, here, get with the here, program. Here, here. And one of the things that we try to do here on the Resiliency Project is bring people stories that we really think they need to hear to, to help them with resiliency, especially in these very difficult uh, times we're going through, times with, with what we're seeing in the US, but also with COVID-19. Today, I am so happy PJ, that uh, we're, we're traveling virtually to South Africa, and we're going to hear the story of an incredible athlete, uh, an athlete that in 2015 was in the running for what's known as the Laureus Award uh, for top athletes with disabilities around the world. In 2015, uh, Peter Peter Van, Van, Prea, Van Prea, I should say, was in the running for that. And we're going to bring you Peter's story today. He was a semi-professional athlete uh, participating in triathlon uh, when he was in his early 20s. He, uh, in fact, participated here in Canada, in Edmonton, in uh, a big World Cup event at that time. Uh, but when he was 23, he was back in South Africa on his bike when he was hit by a car. And it was a devastating accident that he had. Um, Peter actually was in the hospital, in the ICU, I think he will tell us, for 42 days. He was on a ventilator for 32 days, but he survived incredibly. He ended up breaking his neck. Uh, he became a quadriplegic, but once he recovered, it didn't take Peter long, PJ, to, to find sport again and to find elite sport and to be doing some incredible things. He was the first quadriplegic athlete to compete uh, compete in and complete an Ironman triathlon. And just to give you a sense of that, he finished the Ironman triathlon in, in under 14 hours. So we're gonna talk to Peter a little bit about that. Uh, he was the first person with a spinal cord injury to swim that eight kilometer crossing that people might know if they've been to South Africa. It's that icy cold stretch of Atlantic Ocean between Cape Town and Robben Island. Robben Island, of course, is where Nelson Mandela was in prison for all those years. And in Tokyo next year at the Paralympics, Peter is also hoping for another first there, which we're hoping to, to talk to him a little bit about today. Peter, welcome to the Resiliency Project. You know, I wanted a chance though, Teddy, just before we brought Peter up here, I wanted to show people, if you don't mind, if you'll just indulge me, a little bit about kind of who this man is, just so that they're prepared. There's no line you're finding before and after my accident. In my mind, it's just one continuous path. I was running before my accident, and I'm still running. Maybe just in a slightly different way. C6 quadriplegic means that you're completely paralyzed from your nipples down. You only have limited arm function. I don't have any triceps. I don't have any finger or hand movement. I only have wrist extension, biceps, and shoulders. Pretty impressive, Pretty. I think, don't you? Pretty incredible. And uh, to, to tell us a little bit more, I, I would like to welcome Peter to the show from his home in Johannesburg. Peter. Good afternoon for you. Good morning for us here in Canada. <laughs> How's it, guys? How are you doing? Very well. How are you? So, Peter, no, tell, well. 
tell us a little bit about what things are like, what life is like in, in South Africa these days dealing with COVID-19. We don't hear a lot of news from, from your neck of the woods. Tell us what it's been like for you and your family. Yeah, look, I mean, it's been very interesting. Um, we, you know, luckily it's the lockdown has been lifted quite a bit now. Um, we, we're on level three, you know, we've got these different levels, but um, we were on level five for about four weeks, um, three to four weeks, I can't remember exactly. And in that level, we were like homebound, completely locked down. Um, we weren't allowed outside, um, had to train and do everything inside your house or whatever you had. So um, it was very interesting and a, a time to be very innovative. Um, but, you know, I'm me and my family are very blessed that, uh, you know, in terms of work and those kind of things, um, that we could sort of carry on doing what we do um, and still get a salary and those kind of things. I think there were people that took some really hard knocks um, uh, from an economic point of view. So, um, you know, from that perspective, we, we can't complain. You know, it is what it is and we just had to deal with it. You, you mentioned doing some innovative things um, with your training. What kinds of things did you do? Yeah, look, I mean, um, luckily, like with cycling, uh, you know, I always sort of tend to still do um, all three disciplines, even though I might be focusing on the one or the other or do all three, depending on what, what race is up next. Um, but yeah, so for me, um, I, I, I firmly believe it's very important to keep my swimming going. It keeps the range of my shoulders going. Um, and um, yeah, so I had to uh, figure out a way how, how I was going to swim. We've got a pool at home. Um, but um, it's not a pool where you're going to go swim laps up and down the pool. And it was very cold um, already um, at the start of winter coming. Um, so um, I sort of had to swim uh, and ended up having like tie downs um, to keep myself stationary in the pool. And then I was just swimming stationary in one position in the pool. So, um, yeah, it was quite fun to actually do something different. I mean, I've, you've never thought of, never had to do those kind of things. So, but then, you know, you've, you've got the indoor train already set up on the bike. So, uh, you know, it was pretty simple to keep the bike going. And, um, yeah, you know, the racing chair, you've also got your indoor trainers and those kind of things. So it was really easy. Um, and then it was just about, um, you know, doing some extra weight training and those kind of things to um, keep yourself going for the amount of training that you're not really doing. You, you obviously were doing a little bit less hours and those kind of things um, as you were doing it indoors. So, um, so I did some weight training and those kind of things in the wheelchair. So. But yeah, that was um, me. You know, I, I would be honestly say I don't feel like I've lost any fitness or those, you know, like I went backwards or anything. I think we managed to maintain very well. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I'm fortunate with the resources and the the, the um, land that I have around my house, et cetera, to have been able to do it. Because I think some people live in much smaller places um, or apartments and, and they won't be able to do what I, I did during lockdown. I should mention that if people are watching and they have questions for us, please feel free to to give us your questions. PJ, uh, my partner here, will will try and make sure we get them to Peter. Um, Peter, when you you mentioned kind of feeling fortunate that you 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 didn't have it as bad as as others may may have who who may have contracted the virus and things of that nature. Uh, and people are going through some very serious issues as a result. But years ago, when you went through your accident, you were in the hospital, I, I mentioned earlier off the top, in the ICU for, what was it, uh, uh, 32 days or 42 days, I should say, and on a respirator for 32 days or something along those lines. How much did did that and what you were hearing about what people were going through in the worst cases with COVID-19 maybe give you back some of those memories of what you went through? Mm. Look, I mean, I, I will be honest. I think people who haven't been through a serious um, situation, traumatic situation like that, um, you know, you can try and understand as best you can, but if you haven't been in it, um, being on a ventilator or being in the ICU for even just a week or 10 days, um, you know, things like that, it, it's very difficult to comprehend that it isn't fun and that it is a tough situation. So, so for me, look, I, I definitely, I don't want to say if it resonates the right word, but, um, you know, it, it definitely made me think of those days, um, you know, hearing of some people who had to spend a, a, a quite a number of days in ICU and were suffering. Um, and, you know, it definitely does bring back some of those memories where I was lying in ICU. And I mean, I, I was actually in a induced coma the first week, but I, you know, during that time, I, I knew exactly what was going on around me. And. Um, yeah, you know, there were some 
scary moments in ICU when I was there as well. And yeah, I mean, it definitely brings back some of that stuff. But again, for me, all of those memories, I always I almost want to say I cherish them because I feel they make you stronger if you if you make it, if you think about them in the right way, you know. Um, and for me, it was more, I almost reflected that, yes, you know, it brought back those memories, but look how far I've come, you know, and, and look where we are today. So, yeah. What was the Peter when when people are are going through um, these these things and trying to find the the light at the end of the tunnel, if if I can call it that, in terms of resilience and reinvention for you when after you started to to recover, what was the thing that you you would say was the aha moment for you that might help others going through going through whatever they're going through right now with COVID nineteen? Sure. Um... My accident was a very interesting story, and you know, it was. Um, I, I'm a man of faith. I'm no angel, um, but I definitely say faith played a big role. But um, you know, for me, I, to be really honest, like one of the aha moments, moments was while I was still um, in my induced coma, and honestly, I knew everything that was going on around me. Even I, I didn't realize that when I wasn't a coma, to be honest. But there was actually some days. Um, 30, 40 people waiting in the waiting room outside. And um, I feel ashamed today to say that, um, that you know, if I had known those people were in accidents, I don't even know if I would have gone to the hospital um, to go and support them. You know, it, it's just, I for me, I, I wasn't befriended enough with them or, you know, it wouldn't have, like, just come across to me that I want to go and visit that guy in the hospital. I didn't know them well enough. And it just made me realize what an impact I made on people's lives on a daily basis. And the fact that those people came out to see me made me realize what a almost want to say responsibility I have um, and what power I actually have to turn this situation around and be an example of, of being the best that you can be and make an impact on people's lives. And that really, I don't know, like that that just made me realize, you know, it doesn't matter what happens and where I go, even though at that point I didn't know what was going on, I was in the coma, I just realized I needed to just go with this and be the best example I can be and deal with it the best that I can. And and did, is it my understanding that you also sort of built little competitions for yourselves, trying records and that, that sort of became really, really important as well as yeah. part of that? So yeah. Tell, yeah, tell, so, tell us a little bit about that. So, you know, once I, it's funny, rehab was a stepping stone, um, but I mean, I was told I won't, I'll never be able to dress myself and, you know, I'd always need somebody to to help me and, and I won't ever be completely independent. And I don't know, I just somehow believed, didn't believe it and I just knew I was going to do it. Um, and I always tell people my getting dressed story because that's where I really started believing in the impossible being possible again. Um, so when I got back home, I still sort of couldn't do anything really. I could put my shirt on. Um, but I figured out every every part that you need, like putting a sock on and putting this on. I didn't like using tools. So I figured it out using what I have. So as I said, I've got no hand or finger movement um, to grip or any of those kind of things. And um, what I did was I dressed myself. I timed myself getting fully dressed once I could dress myself fully, if I can put it that way. And it took me 51 minutes. And... Um, I was dead tired and I just decided, look, I can't dress for almost an hour every day. It's not functional. So I said, okay, I'm going to give myself a functional target. And I made that 15 minutes, one five. And the whole idea was that I would dress every day then for 15 minutes. And once I hit 15 minutes, it doesn't matter where I was. I stopped dressing and then the person that was with me can finish me up. And hopefully as I go on, eventually I'll be fully dressed in 15 minutes. And, um, you know, the lady that was with me, lovely lady, but I could see inside she was laughing. This guy on your marks gets it, goes, she starts my stopwatch. Um, and um, crazy thing is after two weeks, she started cheering me on because she started seeing, yes, like this guy's getting closer and closer to being fully dressed in 15 minutes. And it probably took about a month of doing that every day. And I opened my eyes and I was on 15 minutes and I actually was fully dressed. And then I said, I wasn't going to leave it there. I'm going to make my world record impossible time for a C6 spot to get dressed seven minutes. Um, I mean, there is no such thing, but it was just for me. And I knew I would never get there. But, you know, as I started getting faster, it started, it motivated me because I was getting better at living life as a quad. I started timing everything I did. Anyway, you know, 
opened my eyes, then it was only 12 minutes. Open my eyes, then it was only 11 minutes. And I think it was two months after I started that old story. Um, I, I opened my eyes and I broke seven minutes. And the scary thing is today, I don't tie myself every day anymore, but I go for a record every now and then. And, and my fastest time is two minutes and 41 seconds, which is you know, I got a it. time faster than what I thought was going to be you know, impossible to reach. Do you know, so, you love know, this as a coach, Peter, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, honestly, no. we just don't know what we're capable of. And I want a chance to sort of show the people um, part of your video called Getting Dressed. Yes, yeah. This is just a video where, you know, now, you know, over the years, some of the guys, when they see me do an Ironman and me talking about being independent, they've asked, can I show them how I get dressed or show them how I do this? And then we've made these different videos for them. Um, so it's just yeah, to help guys. But um, yeah, you know, for me, that the whole getting dressed thing, you know, and the timing and those things, obviously that came from sport, but that really opened my eyes again to believe that so much more is possible and it's fine to see a barrier but i see a barrier of impossibility as something that i want to go smash through um you know and i always say you can if you see a lot of times people see something that's impossible um or too difficult and they just don't even go go on and try um but i promise you if you just keep going at it and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying a lot of the times you're going to open your eyes and you will completely surpass what you thought was not possible but what I will also promise you is if you don't reach your dream or your goal, you would have been a hell of a lot closer than if you never even went, started going down that road to start off with. So you know, that's there's, just what I learned from getting dressed. You know? There's a great question here from Facebook from Fabiana Stubrick. What's your next impossible goal to achieve? <laughs> so um, we haven't spoke about the Robin Island swim Um and um, and also Ironman. Look, Paralympics is, is paramount and winning a medal, et cetera, but that's not necessarily something impossible. But I did the Robin Island swim to check how my body handles the cold temperature and hypothermia and that stuff um, because I've got this funny impossible thing in the back of my mind of trying to go for the English Channel one day. Um, so that is one of the big sort of impossible things. I still need to get it past my wife because what happened on my Robin Island swim when I – got hypothermic shock and I was out for 45 minutes when I finished the swim etc I think it put my wife uh, through quite some trauma so I don't know I'm gonna have to figure out some ways to make it um, sort of allow me to do it so because I am a father now as well so but yeah that would be the next one um, but I also believe I can do a sub 12 hour Ironman um, and I would love to get to Kona although I've had some issues uh, you know to try and qualify because the slots are really just for paraplegics and um Racing against the top paraplegics, I'll never get the slot. So, um, you know, I've tried different ways, but um, I'm not going to give up yet. So, Peter, you were talking before about the importance of world records and numbers in your life. And it's interesting because not only are you an athlete in your career, you're an actuarial um, analyst and you work with statistics and numbers. So I wondered if, if you could take us through some of the numbers that have been really important for you and that you kind of talk when you talk about world records, the kinds of things we're, you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. So. Look, I mean, I've got so many. Um, I did write down a couple um, for today. But, yeah, I mean, like I've already mentioned, um, two minutes and 41 seconds for getting dressed. And, um, you know, I, I time like getting out of the car and the fastest. I, I take my chair out and, and I take chair in and out of the car and it's so on. And the fastest for me to get in the car is one minute and 18 seconds. And then I drive off um, from the car to my office desk down basement parking, getting out into the office desk, five minutes and 18 seconds. Um, 16 is the number of international marathons I've, marathons I've won. Um, 35 minutes, 51 seconds was my 10,000 meter world record in 2015. I've got four rainbow jerseys, um, 11 world championship medals. Um, 13 hours, 24 is my time for my Ironman. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's many African record on the marathon. And obviously then the times like sub 12 hour for the Ironman, which I still want to go and do. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I, I can carry on for days. Uh, so, well, definitely a numbered guy. <laughs> I want to ask you about the Ironman, but, but before, just to paint the picture of that Ironman and what that accomplishment actually is all about, tell, tell me what, what a, uh, you are a C6 quadriplegic. What does that mean for those who, who might not understand that? Yes, yeah, so uh, I always talk about functional because, I mean, I ended up breaking my neck and was injured from C3 and C4 level, actually. 
But functionally C6 means that I literally can only move my wrists, my biceps, and my shoulders um, normally. Um, everything else, uh, you know, I, no hand or finger movement. Um, I've got very, very limited tricep function. Um, you know, when I started, there was nothing, so very little, um, and completely paralyzed from the chest down. But the other thing people also don't know about C6 quadriplegia is it's not just the muscle function, but you also have very low blood pressure, so you tend to faint and be dizzy quite often. Um, I can't get my heart rate up. So, for instance, when I'm on the bike um, and I'm pushing hard on an interval, I can't get my heart rate more than 120. You get up, you stand up, and your heart rate will be 120. Um, and also, we don't sweat. So, um, you can overheat um, and so on because you, you just have no sweat. But I don't think people – you don't realize the impact that sweat makes in cooling your body down until you don't have it. So, um, mm -hmm. those are really big things that – that's a big challenge for us when we race um, and, and compete. So, so knowing that, what you just said, and painting the picture of what it's like, tell me a little bit about the challenge of trying to complete a 14-hour Ironman race. Yeah, you know, I still don't think people understand what I did on that day. Um, because first of all, to do something that's never been done before and believe you can do it is one thing. But... For us, quadriplete, a C6 quad, so H1 T51 quad, and not, not fake and not incorrectly classified. I'm a real T51 H1 quad. At that point in time, the fastest marathon um, done by a quadriplegic of my level um, was the, the guy averaged, I think, around 23 kilometers per hour. Um, and I needed to average that for 180 kilometers, time trialing on my own, not drafting behind people. Um, just to make the bike cutoff time. Because we have to make the able body bike cutoff, uh, well, able body cutoff time, swim, bike, and run. Um, so it, it's not just about doing it, it was about finish it, finishing it under the cutoff time. And then if you take into consideration the speeds I had to hold for my, my, my disability, I had to race at, I can't explain it, you know, outside myself just to make the cutoff. So, um, a lot of preparation and there was a lot of believe, you know, sessions and things to make me believe that I can do it, um, that went into it. But um, what is the really scary thing about that Ironman, and it was a real journey of faith and why it is a miracle, is that um, I broke my forearm in three pieces six weeks before. And um, it, it was a guy who did a U-turn um, on his bike without looking. And I just couldn't avoid it. I couldn't miss him. And... Um, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. A plate was put in and my arm was in a cast for two weeks. So only four weeks before the race, the cast came off. But because of the base and, and training hours that well, I Peter, we in, seem to be having... Hi, Peter. We seem to be yeah. having a bit of a technical issue. Hopefully, we, we our audience can still hear you. Can you hear us still? Yes, I can. Okay. I can hear Peter um, still. Peter, too. what kind of... Okay, what, what kind of reaction do you get from, from people when, you, when you've been traveling all over the world competing? What kind of reaction do you get when, when people see you doing what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, it, it's mixed. You know, there's, some people are just, um, you know, they're just completely in awe with just the simple stuff that you do. You know, your daily living, um, you know, driving a car, getting a wheelchair out of the car, those kind of things. Um, but even at the races, you know, it's just, you know, most of the guys haven't always seen all these things and the equipment that you use. So, you know, for them, without even knowing what you do and how you do it, they're just already amazed and, and come and tell you, you know, well done and congratulate you, et cetera, prop, even before the race started, um, which is great. Um, but then you also get the people that I think maybe they've come across disability or know somebody in disability um, who really understand what athletes we, we actually are, you know, um, because I, I still believe, you know, some guys are athletes and some guys are social, more social athletes. And I mean, that's the same in the disability world. Um, so, yeah, you know, so for me, it's always nice when somebody realized the athlete that you are and not the inspiration on top of it as well. So, but yeah, I mean, you, you get all these mixed reactions and, and all of them are great because, I mean, obviously you're making impact on, impact on people's lives. So when people say to you, which I'm sure they do quite often, that you're an inspiration, how do you feel when you hear that? Yeah, look, I, I always say, you know, people ask me very often, um, you know, what inspires me and what motivates me. And I always say, 
if my faith is one, but uh, you know, my biggest motivator is people because when they come up and tell me it's great what I'm doing and they're so amazed at what I do, it inspires me probably more than what I inspire them. And I mean, I say that, but I, I honestly, I don't think people understand how it does inspire us if they come up and actually just tell you and give you a tap on the back. Um, and I mean, that being said, I think that very same thing is something that doesn't happen often enough just in normal life. Um, you know, you could be standing on the opposite side of a till at the end of a very long day. Most people are grumpy and just want to get out of there and nasty with the, the person on the other side of the till, et cetera. And you can just have a simple smile um, and, and just be polite and nice to the people around you. And that can change their day and, and almost want to say that can motivate them and inspire them. So, you know, I think people need to learn that it's great to give each other a pat on the back when, when you, you um, impressed or, or just be nice to each other because it can really inspire. You mentioned earlier on some of the first that you you like to do. Um, the first with Robin Island, maybe the English Channel down the road, the first with the Iron Man and completing that the way you did. You're also hoping for a first at the Paralympics next year in Tokyo if it goes ahead as planned, if if we can get through this COVID um, issue that we're dealing with. Um, tell us a little bit about what that event will mean for you. You 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 will pre hoping to participate in the H1 cycling event, which has never been, for your category, has never been um, uh, held at, at the Paralympics in the past. Tell us what the significance of that event is for you. Yeah, look, for me, it's significant in, in many ways. Um, first of all, you know, I feel I've, I've sort of ticked all the boxes in terms of medals and, and championships, except for the one, and that is the Paralympics. So, um, you know, to get a Paralympic medal would be really special. Um, but secondly, also, since 2004, there hasn't been any endurance events for um, any of my sports, like swimming, um, cycling, or athletics um, in the H1 and T51 and S1 categories, really. So, um, you know, it's almost like they, up to 2004, there was many events for us. Um, so for me, it's significant also in, in the fact that I feel we want to showcase our ability again um, to make the people realize how important it is for us um, for H1s, I want to say, us because we are the most severe um, function-wise uh, um, disabled guys at the Paralympics, um, that the guys need to give us events um, because what we are doing is actually incredible um, and that we are actually incredible athletes because I think they very often overlook us and events have just been taken away from us and gotten less and less um, over the years and I think you know on the one side that they are missing a trick here if I can put it that way because it is really these severe disabilities that need these events because we can't go and participate in any able body events not even competitively just socially so uh, you know it, it's it's really events that that needs to be there um, for us and so that we are able to grow the sport and pull more people in these situations with such severe disabilities into the sport. Um, and I feel over the last couple of years, the Paralympic movement hasn't really, how can I say, I think focused on that. Um, and there's obviously various reasons for that, but um, I hope by our events being there and us athletes, uh, us H1 quadriplegic showcasing um, our talent that um, you know more events will come back into Paralympics for us, not only in cycling, but on the track as well. I think PJ has a question from Facebook for us. I do. Um, and it's a really important one. Who is on your support team? Who Who's behind you? Who's backing you up? Yeah, look, I must be honest. Um, my biggest support team um, before my kid arrived was my wife. Um, but I mean, now it's my wife and my kid. Um, you know, we, we're we just a, a team. Um, and um, that's definitely it. You know, but I, obviously I do have my coach and I've got... Um, you know, my GP and and um, the guy who worked on my bike over the years, etc. You, you, we've just formed a, a big bond um, and the team just seems to work. But um, obviously you get a lot of support from fans and family and friends. Um, but yeah, number one team would be my wife and my son. Um, what, and what, does your, everywhere. what does your son think of what you do, Peter? Look, he's only turned three just now, um, but he's um, he's been to every single event um, that I've participated in, um, 
And actually a very special one on this photo actually um, was world champs in South Africa when he was only four months old when I won and defended my my um, road race title um, at Paracycling World Champs. Um, but yeah, look, for me, I think at this stage, he just sees Papa racing and um, Papa doing competition. So he just loves it when there is a competition and that he can partake and, you know, throw water over me and give me my gels and my things whenever possible. So, um, you know, for me, I think some people sometimes think just it's crazy that I take my kid all over the world with me so young and all this stuff. But, you know, for me, I feel while I can still do this stuff and can expose him to what I actually did, I feel, um, you know, it, it's very, it's a privilege that I have and I feel um, he needs to see what I do. Um, so, yeah, you know, in the back of my mind, I hope he, he thinks that, um, you know, I'm, I'm being a good father than a good example um, of what a true champion is. What, what lesson do you think you're teaching him about abilities? Sure. Look, I mean, that definitely, he's now seen a range of different disabilities and bikes and wheelchairs and crutches and blades etc so yeah i mean i just definitely think he's growing up in a different normal a new normal um which is for me excellent because um you know i didn't grow up knowing about these things and between these people and it it, it almost builds a wall and you are scared of, of, of talking to people with disabilities and i think over the years through paralympics and sports and those things we've broken down those barriers but I just think for him, he, he doesn't see any different. He knows for him, it's just normal. There's these people in wheelchairs and there's people that walk. And yeah, for me, it, it's just super cool. I mean, kids, they're not scared of asking as well. So, I mean, he asks the craziest questions to the craziest people when he sees them. So yeah, what's great. What's the craziest questions he's, he's asked? Sure. I mean, first of all, he's just direct. I mean, he'll, he'll go up and ask the guy, so... Why are, are why can, is your fingers not working or um, you know why can't you walk? So um, you know for me it's, it's more the, the directness of his questions. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean then um, I'm not going to go into it. But I mean obviously like when you start talking about your toiletries and capitalizing and those kind of things, um, <laughs> he's getting exposed to that kind of stuff. You know different people will do it differently. For me, this is my life. He needs to see how my normal in my life is so um yeah so um there's obviously been some interesting questions or sometimes not questions but him trying to do certain things with my catheters and things that um we obviously need to explain to him it, it's not like that for him so he doesn't need to you know so but yeah you know so there's been some very interesting moments <laughs> well, well peter we, we spent a fair bit of time today talking about firsts and, and you doing all these firsts whether it was the robin island swim or the the triathlon the ironman triathlon hopefully next year in tokyo why would you say firsts are so important to you yo um look for me a world record is meant to be broken and it can be taken away it's not yours forever um, that's why world title is is really cool because if you were the world champion in 2017, no one can take that away from you in 2017. But a world first can never, no one can ever do it again. That's yours. And you go to the grave with it and you made history and hopefully you opened up doors for people. Uh, it, it's something that people didn't think was possible and now it is, so now more people are doing it. Um, so that's what's so cool about firsts for me. Um, but it needs to be a significant first. And um, to be honest, I mean, that Ironman, as I said, I don't think people understand how significant that is for in that time and my disability. Um, but, you know, it's mine now and nobody can ever take it away from me. And I didn't do it and just make it. I smashed it, you know, with a broken arm. So, yeah, you know, that's what makes it special. And I saw you quoted as saying people don't remember the second person to go to the moon. They remember the first. Tell, Absolutely. Tell me about that. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's the whole thing. You know, people often ask me, so why did I go ahead and after you broke your arm, why did you have to go and then do it? Why don't you wait for the next one? And the funny thing is there was actually two other quads, but in the sport class above me, so guys with triceps and some hand function, who was also on the road to um, try and do an Ironman. In fact, a guy that participated in Ironman Florida a month before my attempt, um, and he didn't make the swim cut off. 
So, you know, for me, it was just, as I said, a journey of faith, first of all. Um, but I didn't want anybody to take away my dream of 10 years that, I, you know, at that point, it was 10 years since I thought, yes, I, I want to do this. Um, and that's that's exactly the thing. You know, nobody remembers. I, I don't know who the second guy was on the moon. Um, so uh, for me, I had to, if, if I thought it was going to be possible, I had to go and be the first. Um, and, and that's why that's significant for me, because you know they some somewhere along the lines people will still know and everybody that goes and investigates into it they'll know peter dupree was the first quadriplegic so that can't be taken away anymore peter peter this series is all about uh resilience and reinvention what would you say what would you say those two words have come to mean in in your life yeah um look i think my mom passed away in 2012, um, but, you know, even my dad, but I, I think especially my mom had a lot of resilience. Um, and, yeah, you know, I think anybody who has resilience will go far. It doesn't matter what comes their way. Um, so I think, you know, that's why resilience definitely resonates with me as well. Um, I just think it's such a great tool to have in your arsenal um, if you are resilient. So, yeah, you know, that's the one thing. And um, what was the second one you said? Intervention. And re reinvention. A reinvention. Sorry, a reinvention. Uh, you look, reinvention for me, um, also, it almost goes hand in hand with um, being resilient because I think a lot of the time you, when you come across a prob problem or something new or, for instance, in my case, you know, breaking your neck in a new situation, you have to reinvent yourself. But the process of reinvention doesn't just happen. Um, if it does, you are damn lucky and you just strike it lucky on the first time. But in most cases, it's, it's, it's failure after failure after failure. And if you don't have resilience, you're not going to get there. But it's so important to get there and reinvent yourself because, um, you know, life needs to carry on. Um, doesn't matter what hits you, what obstacles hit you. And, you know, I always say when a bad thing happens, it's an opportunity to be great. So you need to have that, make that one mind shift that could be the solution to the problem um, and reinvent yourself. And just, I almost want to say, want to rethink the situation from a different angle. And I can promise you, there's always some way to turn it around into something useful. Is that the biggest lesson that you can share with folks that sort of helped you when you were going through the worst of what you were going through? Is that changing that mindset that you might've had that could have been quite negative and you turned it into something very positive. Yes. I, I mean, I would definitely say that. The the craziest thing about my story is I never looked back. Um, you know, I never had an off day up till today. Uh, I'm probably still in denial, according to most psychologists. Um, but, uh, yeah, for me, it just happened in the right place in the right time. You know, I, it's almost like I was ready for it and I was born to be a quiet kind of thing. Um, so it, it's very strange to say that. But, because I already had that reinvention and mind shift way of thinking to find a solution to the problem, I think that absolutely made the difference of how I approach everything in rehab and after my accident and my life. Um, and if I didn't have that, I think it would have been a lot harder. And I mean, if you speak to most guys who are in accidents, some never get to living life. Um, some take years, some take longer, some take shorter. Um, but I think if they had that mindset from the start, it would have been immediate. So I definitely think it, for me, it, 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 it's a game changer. So for anybody, Peter, as a final question for you here, unless PJ has something else, what would you say to anybody who's, who's potentially struggling right now uh, for whatever reason, because of the, what we're going through with COVID-19 and maybe their life has been turned upside down, maybe difficulty keeping keeping their job going and their company going, what, what what have you said or what would you say to them? Yeah, look, everybody's situation is different. So you might say different things to, to people, but um, I would just say, keep believing in yourself. Um, and, you know, I always also say, you know, a situation and people and anything can hurt your body and it, you know it but it, it can't touch you and who you are and your soul 
So I, I would almost say people must not allow a situation like this in COVID or any bad thing that happens to them define who they are. They can define who they are themselves, inside themselves. Um, and yeah, you know, I would also just say, just hang in there um, because I, you know, I honestly believe we are going to get through this, but you have to have that, you have to make that mind shift, um, you know, and think of all the things that you have overcome throughout your life. Um, and I'm pretty sure that would be a lot more than the sport that you have to overcome now. So I don't know if that would help. <laughs> I'm sure it will actually help in, in, way, in many more ways than you can ever imagine, Peter. Peter, thank you for, for taking the time today to, to join us here on the Resiliency Project. I'm really looking forward and I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to meet each other in person next year in Tokyo if, uh, if the Olympics and the Paralympics finally go ahead as scheduled. Uh, I'm hoping to be there to help the International Paralympic Committee tell stories like yours around the around the world so hopefully we can meet in person there guys can i no. say one last thing it's one last comment that belongs to facebook this has been a privilege to listen to your story and bridget sweeney you say it perfectly what an inspirational man well, what an inspirational man for sure and also what a what a terrific athlete peter and i think you're absolutely right that that's the one thing that i'm really hopeful people will, watching today or, or hearing down the road will, will understand a little bit more. Uh, people actually have seen Blade Runners and, and they see people maybe missing a leg, putting on a prosthetic leg and running, speeding down the track, but they don't necessarily understand you and your story and what you do, like all the hours of training that it took to get even in into that Ironman competition. I think those are the kinds of stories I'd like to people to be able to understand a little bit more and all the athleticism involved. Mm, no, definitely. Um, but yeah, look, thanks a lot for the chat as well. And thanks for what you guys are doing. And I would definitely love to meet you guys at the Paralympics. Um, it, it would be an honor. So thank you. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed that they go ahead, Peter. And congratulations again on all that you're doing. Thank you again for joining us here. So Peter Van Priya is someone to watch, as, as we were saying, at the Paralympics next year in Tokyo, competing in the H1 hand cycling event. Uh, he joined us from his home in Johannesburg. Thank you again, Peter. And thanks to you for joining us here on the Resiliency Project. We bring you stories around resilience and reinvention. We'll be back here in another couple of weeks. So join myself and my co-host, PJ Kwong. Bye for now. Just guys. Nice.